this is Fernando Lara. I recorded this uh, audio with a slide presentation in case something doesn't work well with Skype uh, today. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers, Julia and Laureen, for inviting me to this seminar and for being generous enough to allow me to present uh, remotely uh, today. Uh, also, Greg Castillo, who I think is there on this session today. Uh, it's been a while, it's great to be uh, virtually in contact with you today. So thank you so much to uh, UC Berkeley for the invitation. Uh, I'm gonna talk about how modernism modernist vocabulary became the vernacular, became so popular and so widespread in Brazil. That's the uh, topic of my dissertation uh, many years ago and uh, a book and a few articles. Uh, so uh, bear with me as I read the paper and uh, show you the slides. Uh, modern and vernacular how Brazilian mid-century architecture problematizes this inherent contradiction. From a North American perspective, the words modernism and vernacular seem incompatible. We have learned from architects and scholars as diverse as Robert Venturi, Habraken, or UC Berkeley's own Dale Upton, that irreconcilable differences between modern architecture and popular taste prevented modernism from engaging with the vernacular. And even when the United States seemed to embrace modern architecture, the infatuation only lasted for about 15 years after World War II, as we are reminded by Beatriz Colomina, a mere dalliance in architectural time. The language of modernism, to use a linguistic metaphor, was never spoken long enough by the population at large to extend the chance of becoming vernacular. The relationship between architecture and popular culture is very complex, and I don't have much time to elaborate here. Let's just remember that uh, high architecture alternatively diverges from and converges with popular culture. Uh, the moments of divergence and coincidence are many, and the origins of this oscillation can be traced way back to the Renaissance to Alberti when we have the classic division between architect and builder. Uh, separated from common buildings, architecture becomes its own typology, limited, limited to structures designed by architects. So the definition of architecture as buildings designed by architects is very problematic to me. Uh, such separation is crucial for the definition of architectural practice nowadays and provides the basis for, its, for the profession. Uh, it's not surprising, therefore, that architects pay little or no attention to buildings designed by anybody else, whether engineers, builders, contractors, or the owners themselves. For to do so would threaten the foundations of our professional identity. Architecture is not the only discipline marked by a complex relationship between high and low manifestations. If we follow Andreas Huysen, we see that high art and popular culture manifestations uh, have always had a volatile relationship, especially after modernity. Uh, since the 18th century, the gap between high and popular art has steadily widened, as art has increasingly become a medium for individual expression rather than a public ritual. Uh, and that is Peter Berger, the, the theories of the avant-garde. This volatile relationship culminated in the modernist avant-garde notion of using the arts to transform the practices of life. Since the exhaustion of this approach, the divide between high art and popular culture have grown even wider, and especially difficult to bridge in architecture because of the economic dynamics of the profession. Architecture is extremely expensive. As many authors point out, the division between high architecture and popular culture has never been so pronounced as after modernism. Uh, Habraken uh, states that the modernist era was the first in history where the dialogue between fields, as he conceptualizes regular buildings, and architecture, the ones designed by architects, was disrupted. Uh, 
Denise Scott Brown also wrote decades ago that architects are still reacting strongly against the notion that mundane local examples may have something to teach them. Uh, working against this dichotomy and hoping to preserve local cultures from the threat of universalizing currents, Kenneth Frampton articulated in the early 1980s the idea of critical regionalism. According to Frampton, universal trends should be filtered through and combined with local influences to generate an architecture that can respond to both local culture and universal civilization. While I agree with the core of Frampton's argument, I believe it has been misused and misinterpreted to the point of being completely undermined. Instead of promoting the value of regional architecture, Critical originalism has singled out for praise a few, very few, hand-picked architects, elevating them to the status of cultural representatives. Mario Botta in the south of Switzerland, Alvaro Cis in Portugal, John and Patricia Patkal in British Columbia, Ricardo Ledoret in Mexico, and uh, our Brazilian Oscar Niemeyer uh, are said to represent entire cultures. Moreover, Critical regionalism operates in only one direction, from the center to the periphery, with little or no possibility for peripheral issues to influence the centers. Uh, in this respect, a vernacular modernism would be the opposite of critical regionalism. Escaping the necessary filter of the informed and rational architect and operating through a distracted but no less rational non-architect. A large number of buildings displaying elements of universal modernism and recombining them with local trends, selectively accepting and rejecting aspects of modernity. This is the framework for the Brazilian phenomenon that I studied. Uh, but while the hybrid nature of the Brazilian disseminations aligns uh, this so-called vernacular modernism, as I call it, with Frampton pre-originalism, the main direction of influence is very different. Uh, in pre-originalism, the architect is the one to derive elements from the vernacular and re-articulate them in high art buildings. The Brazilian case is precisely the opposite. Uh, elements of high architecture are appropriated by lay people and re-articulated into the vernacular. While Frampton's pre-originalism worries about acculturation, the Brazilian vernacular modernism points to a much more complex process of transculturation. And here I'm referencing books edited by Felipe Hernandez out of Cambridge on the process of transculturation. Uh, the fact that the Brazilian middle class of the 1950s adopted modernism as their desired and fashionable style is an intriguing deviation one worthy of investigation in the literature of 20th century architecture. With this difference in mind, I photograph about 600 modernist looking structures in middle and lower middle class neighborhoods in Brazil back in the end of the 20th century, between 1998 and 2003. The vast majority of these houses were not designed by architects, but built by the owners themselves with the help of a contractor and unskilled laborers. Yet, they demonstrate in, ingenious adaptations and applications of a modernist vocabulary. When I started documenting these houses, I was first struck by the predominance of an asymmetrical trapezoid volume created by an unusual roof line, in contrast to the symmetrical pitched roof of a traditional house. While it is easy to distinguish the truly modernist houses in any particular neighborhood by the single uh, slope of the roof or the inverted roofs, uh, concrete slabs supported by thin metallic uh, columns, bris soles, or uh, void ceramic elements uh, that we call cobodros. Windows also provide fine examples of the middle class selective adoption of modernist features. Whereas the building of the wealthy designed by architects have large plate glass windows, most middle class modernist uh, houses have medium sized windows. Their asymmetrical placement, however, 
emulate the high design models. Uh, reinforced concrete canopies often occur in vernacular modernist homes and are frequently supported by very thin metal columns, another feature derived directly from high design. Uh, the occurrence of such concrete slabs and metallic columns is very important for this study because these elements come directly from some of the most famous buildings in Brazil, the Pampulha buildings, which also are in Belo Horizonte here. Uh, Del Upton and John Vlash pointed out about 95% of the built environment is not designed by architects. And Brazil in the 1950s was, of course, no exception. The lack of scholarship regarding popular dissemination of modernism in Brazil and elsewhere in general might be explained by the architect's resistance to recognizing any value in structures that were not designed by one of our own. Thus, vernacular architecture is often defined by what it is not, not high style, not designed by professionals. The question that follows centers on how the Brazilian case should be best framed, given that a vocabulary first introduced by architects was later appropriated by middle class home builders and widely disseminated in millions of their houses. And the numbers here are in millions. Can it still be considered modern? Uh, has it really become vernacular? What explains this rare exchange between design professionals and the general public? Most important is to understand the possible exchanges between architects and the lay public, or in the words of Habrak and in Palladio's children, between architecture and the field that makes this widespread dissemination possible. Generalizing beyond the Brazilian case, the issue of architectural dissemination per se must also be addressed. How does it take place? What are the vectors of information? How are stylistic and spatial trends disseminated? In sum, how could an avant-garde proposal become vernacular? If modernism indeed become vernacular in Brazil, what does this development contribute to the current architectural debate? In other words, how does this unique phenomenon relate to the multiplicity of current architectural theories and proposals? Such a vernacular modernism becomes an intriguing appendix to the broader rediscovery, rediscovery of the modern movement for a number of reasons. First is the very conjunction of those two words, vernacular and modernism. The reconciliation of modernism and popular culture has been deemed unattainable by many of the scholars, mostly the postmodern generation. If modern architecture, in its roots, stressed programs and ideas uh, geared toward the masses, it did move progressively further away from popular demands. Until, by the 1970s, one of the major arguments for its dismissal was that it had never been popular. Postmodernism, with its collage of classical elements, was proposed as an alternative approach to reconciling architecture and popular taste. It is thus striking to learn that, contrary to what postmodernism have long argued, modern architecture has in fact been popular to the extent of becoming vernacular, at least in Brazil, and I suspect that in, in a smaller extent in other countries also. But not even Brazilian architects recognized the importance of this phenomenon at the time. While European and North American critics were correct in observing that modernism have never been popular in their countries. In Florida and California, the spread of the modernist vocabulary was considerably more extensive than the rest of North America. But it still did not achieve the scale or depth of dissemination across social strata that it reached in Brazil. My goal here is not to reprise the arguments of postmodernists and modernists, but to examine how Brazilian vernacular modernism can contribute to the broader debate. Although I analyzed only a few hundred houses built over a limited time span in only a few Brazilian cities, the modernist vocabulary was appropriated elsewhere. In California, for instance, we have the case study houses as another example of the dissemination of modernism, although they were designed by architects 
and located in large lots in a suburban pattern, uh, it can be argued that they influenced much of what is still being built in Southern California. Arguably, similar appropriations occurred in Mexico, Turkey, and India, countries ha that had adopted modernism much like Brazil did. But the impressive extent of the Brazilian phenomenon and the fact that almost no architects were involved in it and the freedom with which the elements of modern architecture are recombined in the facades provide striking evidence that modernism could indeed become vernacular. And that's one of my important points. It could become vernacular if the variables were right. As Adrian Forti and Isabetta Andreoli point out, Brazilian modernism was, in many ways, the inverse of European and North American, what I called NATO-centric modernism. Brazil's particular building challenges involved getting rid of heat rather than retaining it. The costliness of the new materials and the availability of cheap labor. With such different premises, the results inevitably were also quite different. What was unexpected and until a decade ago invisible is the fact that by blending those contradictory trends, the Brazilian working class might have fostered a unique kind of modernism, a modernism with a postmodern attitude. It is important to point out that I do not think that Brazilian vernacular modernism can be reduced to a postmodern phenomenon. The situation here is much more complex. But I do draw on Venturi and Scott Brown's, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown's argument to assert that architects should learn from Brazilian middle class houses and favela structures in the same way that they should learn from the Vegas Strip, reference to their famous book. Moreover, if one of postmodernism's main premises is that modernism has never been popular, how does the pop Brazilian vernacular modernism fit into this discussion? One answer might be that popular modernism was an isolated phenomenon, pertinent only to Brazil and with little impact on the global architectural debate. Fair enough. But to accept this answer, I would need to agree with the traditional conception of center versus periphery, uh, in which only the center is worthy of study and the periphery is without any hope of influence. Uh, another answer might be that the Brazilian phenomenon was not really vernacular, but then how does one explain the tremendous proliferation of modernist looking houses in the Brazilian cities, giving the impression that modernism swept the entire landscape? A third answer might challenge the characterization of Brazilian working class houses as truly modern. For clearly here there is a wide difference between the architect's modernism of wealthy homes and the simplified appropriation of the middle class. Uh, the middle class facades, for instance, might represent their owners' aspirations or insertion into modernity, or at least their desire to participate in it, while the four plans demonstrate their initial refusal to concede to modern life and their insistence on a traditional layout grounded in the Brazilian reality of the 1950s. And I'm referring here to the fact that I documented houses in the early 50s that had a highly modern facade and a plan that was uh, almost identical to early 20th century plans. Uh, and only later in the 50s, the plans of the Brazilian houses start changing, increasing the uh, privacy levels by having a hallway separating the bedrooms from the dining room, uh, those kind of things. Uh, it's, it, I don't have much time to, to elaborate the, the changes in the plans here. You have to rely on the images. Uh, in the favelas, uh, cost and benefits may have driven the adoption of concrete frames and slabs, but this renders the existence no less symbolic uh, talking to favela dwellers and construction workers who built both the, actually built all of them, the elite houses, the middle class houses, and their own houses in their favelas, I learned that while having a concrete slab 
a laje in Portuguese over their heads means better protection, it also means being inserted into modernity. Therefore, what I propose is that we reverse the question. Instead of asking how Brazilian vernacular modernism might fit into the broader architectural debate, we might ask why modernism never became vernacular in the United States or in Europe. The answer to this question, I am convinced, must be site-specific and therefore will have less to do with any shortcomings of the modernist paradigm per se and more to do with local implementation. Uh, I'm referring here to the uh, definition that I really like by Marshall Berman, uh, Marshall Berman uh, of modernism as the artistic result of the conflict between aspirations of universal modernity or universal aspirations of modernity and local modernization. So modernity and modernization are seldom in sync. They are usually at odds with each other and modernism thrives from that, which is precisely the case in Brazil. Uh, I, I do not argue that modernism was a perfect proposal any more than I deny the repetitive nature of so many modernist buildings or the boring echoes of the international style, not to mention the disastrous modernist experiments in urbanism whose legacy still haunts most of the big cities around the world. So I'm referring here to modern architecture as more transformative and more emancipatory, while modern urbanism has almost always been in the side of social control, uh, gentrification, and uh, optimization of profit uh, on, the, on the land profit. Uh, instead, I'm interested in whether modernism could have become vernacular elsewhere under some of the favorable conditions that existed in Brazil. Among those conditions, I highlight uh, first, government support for modernist architecture. Uh, second, the coming together of architects around the modernist proposal. Uh, third, the media's embrace of modernization as a marketing strategy. And fourth, the middle class thirst for modernization. And fifth and last, the interactions between the realms of high and popular art. Uh, it does not seem fruitful to speculate on how those conditions could have led, have led to similar acceptance of modern architecture in the uh, NATO-centric North America and Europe world. Rather, it seems pertinent to ask in this seminar uh, whether something inherent in the modernist paradigm made it unpopular. My answer, based on the research presented here, can only be that no, there is nothing inherently unpopular in modern architecture. This is, to me, the most important conclusion to be drawn from the study of Brazilian vernacular modernism. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, read this paper and present those images to you. Uh, I sincerely hope that Skype connections are working fine today and we will be able to uh, have this conversation. I mean, if you are uh, listening to this audio, we probably had some problems on the Skype connection. Uh, but I hope I am reading this paper again and we can continue the conversation about uh, the, the, the popular in the arts and uh, the Brazilian case. Thank you so much.